This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Githu Yort. It's Tuesday, July 13th. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. This is today's Africa 54. Authorities continue to press for calm across South Africa Tuesday following Monday's looting and violence in the aftermath of former President Jacob Zuma's imprisonment. President Cyril Ramaphosa says the unrest is damaging efforts to rebuild the economy in the wake of COVID-19. David Doyle has more. South Africa's horizon was blotted with smoke on Monday as a weekend of sporadic looting and violence prompted by the jailing of former President Jacob Zuma continued to rage. Unrest by pro-Zuma supporters has been focused on his home province, KwaZulu-Natal. Footage showed a mall set ablaze in its capital, Pietermaritzburg, and looting in KwaZulu-Natal's biggest city, Durban. But the disorder has also spilled to South Africa's main commercial city, Johannesburg. National intelligence body Nat Joints reported that six people have been killed in violent protests since last week, and more than 200 arrested. On Sunday, President Cyril Ramaphosa said people's lives and efforts to rebuild the economy amid the coronavirus pandemic were being endangered. There can never be any justification whatsoever for anybody to embark on violent and destructive and disruptive actions that negatively affect the rights of others. Zuma was sentenced to 15 months in prison for contempt of court after failing to appear before a corruption inquiry. On Monday, he was back in court, asking for his jail term, which he started last week, to be rescinded. Legal experts say his chances of success are slim. Zuma and his supporters say he's the victim of a political witch hunt orchestrated by Ramaphosa's allies. But police say that anger is now being exploited by criminals to steal and cause damage. And on Monday, South Africa's military said soldiers would be deployed to help quell the unrest. That was Reuters' David Doyle reporting. The United Nations Human Rights Council on Tuesday called for an immediate end to all violations in Ethiopia's conflict-torn Tigray region and for Eritrean troops to quickly withdraw in a verifiable manner, according to the Paris-based AFP news agency. Meanwhile, a rebel spokesman says its forces have launched a new offensive in Ethiopia's Tigray region. Getacho Reda told AFP by telephone that its forces routed divisions of the Federal Defense Forces and the Amhara Forces. A spokesman for the Ethiopian Federal Army was not immediately reachable, and it is almost impossible to verify Reda's claims, as communication networks in the region are mostly severed. Reda says Monday's rebel offensive occurred in parts of the southern and western areas of Tigray, which were still controlled by Amhara forces, which came to support the Ethiopian Federal Army in this conflict, now marked by alleged atrocities and the growing possibility of famine. COVID-19 continues to surge across Africa and the worst is yet to come, according to the continent's director at the World Health Organization. Africa has just marked its worst pandemic week ever, surpassing the second wave peak. During the week, which ended on the 4th of July, there were more than 251,000 cases, a 20% increase over the previous week, and a 12% jump over the January peak. In total, on the continent, there have now been almost 5.7 million COVID-19 cases, and 146,000 people sadly have lost their lives. New cases have increased for the seventh week running, for Africa, the worst is yet to come as the fast-moving third wave continues to gain speed and new ground in countries. Genomics expert Professor Tulio D. Oliveira says the more infectious Delta coronavirus variant is spreading rapidly throughout Africa, accounting for roughly three-quarters of the genome sequenced on the continent recently and driving up deaths. The global vaccine distribution plan COVAX is targeting to deliver 520 million COVID-19 vaccine doses this year to Africa, 
which has some of the lowest coronavirus vaccination rates worldwide. By the end of the first quarter of 2022, COVAX aims to supply nearly 800 million additional vaccine doses. African countries are expected to receive doses from COVAX portfolio of nine vaccines, which as well as AstraZeneca include shots developed by Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and Moderna. The World Health Organization Regional Office for Africa is warning of a rampant spread of more contagious COVID variants as a third wave of COVID-19 infections sweeps across the continent of Africa. Observers say the third wave promises to be much more difficult than the previous ones of the continent on the continent and warn that vaccination levels are low. Countries in Africa have received the AstraZeneca vaccine made in India, COVID shield, but the European Union medical regulatory body says it will not accept the India-made AstraZeneca as part of its vaccine passport. The move is raising concerns as well as criticism. Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu spoke with Dr. Fiona Braca, emergency operations manager with the WHO Africa region. We have the tools uh, to prevent the spread of the virus, and um, it's important that uh, the, there is heightened uh, awareness. Uh, we are in a third wave in the region. We need to use the tools that we have to prevent uh, the, the further spread of the virus. It boils down to the leadership of the different countries. We have several countries where we have the researches actually going on. So uh, preparedness is key. It includes uh, heightened surveillance, preparedness for critical care, because uh, with the Delta variant, we have high transmissibility. We've also seen uh, evidence that there is prolonged and more severe disease. So working with the countries to build their capacities for uh, treatment, it boils down to information uh, management, the, the management of risks at the individual level using the public health um, and social measures. It also boils down to capacities to manage severe cases. Africa has had its challenges we forgot to access to vaccine. The continent is still below 2% when it comes to vaccination rate. So that's one of cha the challenges. The other challenge is the fact that there is a high rate of vaccine hesitancy among the population. So how do we reconcile both? To date, 15 million Africans have been fully vaccinated, which vaccinated, which represents just 1.2 percent of the African population. We have seen that uh, over 70 percent of the uh, doses that have been uh, given to the continent have actually been administered. If we are really going to achieve the targets that were, WHO has called on member states to achieve, which is 10 uh, percent of their uh, population vaccinated by end of uh, September and an additional 30 percent of uh, their population vaccinated by end of um, 2021. We are going to need one billion doses uh, in Africa. When it comes to vaccine uh, acceptance, many of them fear the side effects. Many would like to to wait and see uh, how this evolves with people they know receiving the vaccine. These are issues that need to be addressed um, at the local level and devising a tailored, uh, targeted uh, strategies to address uh, these concerns. Uh, once available, ensuring that the supply of vaccine is, is, is there, ensuring that there are mechanisms to reach the populations that need the vaccines the European Union recently announced that uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine made in India, which is called Covishield, will not be accepted as part of, it, of the vaccine passport in Europe. What is your reaction and how is the WHO addressing this? AstraZeneca is among the uh, vaccines that have gone through the WHO review and accepted for, for use. Based on that, the COVAX facility um, did go ahead to procure these vaccines, and most of the countries in the African region have benefited uh, from, from this facility. We need to uh, work at the global level to ensure that um, there is acceptance of this tool that is in place, that uh, people can be allowed the opportunity to use the vaccine and not have the fear of not being able to travel to a given region or another because of lack of a vaccine. What does this mean, though, for the people 
who have already received AstraZeneca made in India uh, if they want to go to Europe. I think that there's going to have to be some strong engagement uh, uh, from from the countries that have benefited from this uh, vaccine to ensure that uh, this decision is looked at critically and the implications it has for people that have received it around the world. What is being done on the continent to ensure that African scientists, science on the continent is also part of this big picture. We're pleased to note that um, the uh, president of, of South Africa and the WHO director uh, general uh, recently launched um, an initiative to set up technology transfer uh, hub, the first globally that will be based in South Africa that will allow the vaccine uh, vaccine stakeholders, global stakeholders, uh, the local, local stakeholders to come together and provide uh, capacity building and technology transfer to start the production of the COVID-19 vaccines uh, on the continent. At the recent World Health uh, Assembly in May, uh, over 100 countries did sign an initiative for local uh, production 54 of these countries were from the African uh, continent, uh, led by Ethiopia. We are quite optimistic that these uh, initiatives will help to galvanize the support locally using both public and private uh, uh, partnerships and government initiatives uh, to scale up production in the, in the African uh, region. At least 45 countries in Africa have received doses of Covishield, the AstraZeneca vaccine produced by the Serum Institute of India, a major supplier of the COVAX initiative. The WHO and COVAX have issued a joint statement calling vaccine travel certificates that do not include all WHO sanctioned versions as counter-effective. U.S. President Joe Biden is calling on Haiti's political leaders to unite for the good of their country. President Biden says, quote, the people of Haiti deserve peace and security. Biden says he is closely following developments in the Caribbean nation in the wake of President Jovenel Moise's assassination last Wednesday. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is urging Haiti's political leaders to work toward holding free and fair elections later this year. The United States is in close consultations with our Haitian and international partners to support the Haitian people in the aftermath of the assassination of President Moïse. Uh, we urge the country's political leaders to bring the country together around a more inclusive, peaceful, and secure vision and pave the road toward free and fair elections this year. Uh, yesterday, we sent an interagency delegation to Port-au-Prince to assess the situation, which, together with our constant contact with Haitian officials and other stakeholders, uh, will help determine how the United States can best support Haiti in a very difficult time. Uh, I want to reiterate our deepest condolences to the family of President Moïse and to the Haitian people and wish First Lady Marine Moïse a swift uh, recovery. One of Haiti's most powerful gang leaders is threatening to wade into the streets and rest and demonstrations and throw the impoverished Caribbean country deeper into chaos. Emily Wither has the details. He is one of Haiti's most powerful gang leaders, and his threats risk plunging Haiti into deeper chaos. Jimmy Cherizier, a former cop known as Barbecue, heads the so-called G9 Federation of Nine Gangs. In a new video address, he says his men would take to the streets to protest the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse. Many people from the opposition and stinking bourgeoisie joined together to betray the president. It is a national and international conspiracy against the Haitian people. I ask all the gangs to mobilize, take to the streets. We demand explanations about the assassination of the president. We had a problem with the president but we have never said that foreigners can enter our territory to kill the president. Moïse was gunned down before dawn on Wednesday at his Port-au-Prince home. 
Haitian authorities say a unit of trained assassins compromising 26 Colombians and two Haitian Americans carried out the murder. The murder and the still murky plot behind it has caused further political instability in the long troubled country. The government is calling for US and UN assistance. The US says it has no plans to provide Haiti with military assistance for now, while the request to the UN would need Security Council authorization. Chezier says his followers will practice legitimate violence and that it's time for the masters of the system, business magnates of Syrian and Lebanese descent who dominate parts of the economy, to give back the country. Some of the magnates had been at loggerheads with Moïse. Meanwhile, in a taped recording, Moise's widow Martine, who was also wounded in the attack, accused shadowy enemies of plotting his assassination to thwart democratic change. She says her husband had spoken of dark forces behind years of unrest. Rivals and oligarchs angry about what he called his attempts to clean up government contracts and politics. Haitian officials have not provided a motive for the assassination or explained how the killers got past Moise's security detail. Emily Wither of Reuters filed that report. Let us know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered during the discussion on Facebook. Our address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Next up, meet the women who are breaking stereotypes through their love of motorcycles. We'll be right back. Be sure to join me for the next Straight Talk Africa as we continue our in-depth look at the lives and experiences of people who have had to flee their homes and communities and start over elsewhere. We'll bring you part two of VOA's new documentary, A Day in the Life of Refugees. You do not want to miss that on the next Straight Talk Africa. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Linoch Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. Afghan interpreters were invaluable to American troops during two decades of war. Now that U.S. forces are pulling out, Afghans who aided Americans fear for their lives as the U.S. government processes thousands of visa applications to allow them to emigrate. Viewers Caroline Prasuti has the exclusive story of two former interpreters who say they are in grave danger. Haji could be here, or he could be here, or here. He moves from city to city for safety from the Taliban. For 11 years, he worked as an interpreter for U.S. Special Forces, braving firefights across Afghanistan, as he told VOA via Skype. In Logan province, in Kabul, a lot of these places, Nuristan, Ningrahar province. Haji, the name we use to protect his identity, has U.S. awards for his shrapnel wounds and for saving the lives of two Army captains. They saved me, I saved them, because we are teammates. In 2010, the Taliban kidnapped Haji's nine-year-old son because of his job and asked for ransom. They know I'm working with the American forces, and uh, they are infidel, and you are also infidel because you are working with them, and you providing all kind of uh, help to them. The Afghan police rescued his son a few weeks later in a gun battle with his kidnappers. He says they killed an older son a few months ago. Now Haji is trying to save his own life after cell phone threats from the Taliban. They tell me uh, they know my place, where I'm staying, and they, they were coming, uh, coming up to me. Haji applied for a special immigrant visa, an SIV, more than three years ago. The embassy told him processing is delayed. Yeah. President Biden said this about interpreters yeah. like Haji. There is a home for you in the United States, if you so choose, and we will stand with you 
just as you stood with us. But the process is so complicated. Ishmael Khan came to the United States on an SIV seven years ago. He was an interpreter alongside Haji, seen here on the right, whom he nicknamed GPS when he spoke to VOA on Skype. He knew where to go, where, uh, what, uh, route to take, what would be the easiest, where are possible places for them to ambush us to, to make sure that they are alert. He tried everything to make sure that his team survive and be successful. But Khan worries for his former colleague. They are after him. He, he's going to get killed if, if he doesn't get out. Those who helped the Americans often protest in Afghanistan for safe passage out. Since January, the Biden administration has approved 2,500 special visas for Afghans who assisted the military. And 1,000, like Khan, have settled in the U.S. But there are many still there, including an interpreter we will call James. And they're about to take over. James has been denied the special visa because he cannot provide paperwork proof of his employment. It's really scary. It's really scary because brutal Taliban, they're never forgive us. James told VOA that fears for his safety and that of his family keep him awake at night. And like Haji, he worries what will happen after the complete withdrawal of U.S. troops on August 31st. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News. The Maldives, a tiny nation of about 1,200 islands set in crystalline waters, depends on tourism. The pandemic cut that revenue in half. But with COVID on the run, the government is wooing tourists, especially those from China. VOA's Janine Pak Didam reports. Nearly half of the Maldives' 500,000-plus residents have gotten at least one dose of a COVID vaccine. And as the island nation recovers from the virus, the tourists are starting to return as well. In the first quarter of this year, 390,000 tourists arrived in the Maldives, almost a pre-pandemic number. But only 504 travelers came from China. We haven't got them yet, uh, so we are, we are eagerly waiting for the... Chinese tourists to come back and when they start coming back, we are very positive that they will again become the lead source market for the Maldives. According to a recent survey by management consultancy McKinsey, only 43% of Chinese tourists want to venture overseas these days. One stay-at-home traveler, Xiang Shifan, spoke with VOA from his home in Changzhou, China. The problem for me is like I don't, I don't have much time. I think most Chinese are worried about one thing, like if you're going, you know, leaving China, you will be, um, it will be okay for you. But if you're coming back to China, you, you're from abroad. For Chinese government, they were thinking like you're dangerous, then they will just give you like uh, 14 days in the hotel, and that's a lot of waste of money and time. Nonetheless, the respected Pacific Asia Travel Association, or PARA, said the Chinese enthusiasm for domestic travel indicates that travelers will want to jet abroad soon. In China, you saw there was a pent up demand when, there, when they started slowly opening domestically. You saw hot spots in, in, or tourist spots in China being overwhelmed by, by visitors, by domestic visitors. So we could, we could safely assume that when borders open, or Chinese tourists and Chinese are allowed to travel abroad, there will be pent up demand for them to travel overseas. Hara stressed that wooing back international travelers, including those from China, will require destinations to provide clear communication about health and safety and clear guidelines on how to enter a country. The organization added that the Maldives has a geographic advantage due to its islands which means that outbreaks can be contained quickly if they were to happen. We, we look forward to welcoming the tourists and uh, uh, give them a longer stay for those who wish. The Maldives are now allowing tourists to start out with a 30-day visa and extend their stay up to 90 days. This is Janine Pakdidam, VOA News, New York. Lydia Reyes of Los Angeles, California, loves riding her Harley Davidson motorcycle she eventually started a nonprofit group called Biker Chicks and dreams of becoming a professional motorcycle mechanic. 
Genia Delu spoke with Grace and other women who share her passion for motorcycles. It's been 15 years since Lydia Reyes completed her motorcycle riding classes with distinction. She says for her, riding a motorcycle feels liberating. When you start learning how to ride and you conquer that fear, um, that helped me throughout the years, believe it or not. So to me, it was more of like, um, like, if I can do this, I can do anything else. Reyes says she also learned to fight gender stereotypes in a world where women bikers are a definite minority. And she has her husband's full support. Clubs, riders, you know, it, it, they feel like it's a man's world, you know, and the women need to be on the back end and they do and say as the man does. I look at it different, you know, if, if they're capable of doing it, why not? More power to you. Let's do this. Reyes bought her first Harley-Davidson motorcycle in 2013 after her children were born, and she modified it mostly by herself. Today she's thinking about becoming a professional motorcycle mechanic. Reyes's passion for biking was so strong she founded a female motorcycle club called Biker Chicks. She says it's a club where women like her, free from stereotypes and loving speed, support each other while sharing their passion a machine that you're in total control of and this machine can do powerful things and you have control of it you just sit on it and take it for a ride and you have the power to slow it down you have the power to throttle all the way through it's an amazing freedom I don't worry about anything I don't worry about the house I don't worry about the kids I don't worry about having to cook what I need to do I need to do laundry dishes none of that I don't have to worry about any of that when I'm on my bike when I'm on my bike I'm me I'm not the wife, I'm not the mom, I'm me. I just feel very proud of myself to be a Chicana and be able to say that I'm an independent woman and I have my own business and I'm able to afford these things for myself, coming from, a, from poverty. These women say however different they are, on a motorcycle they share common feelings, empowerment, freedom and independence. Jenny Adulu for VOA News, Los Angeles, California. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.